Good afternoon, and uh, you're very welcome. I'm Alex White, Director General of the Institute of International European Affairs. I'm delighted to have you with us um, for this event this afternoon, um, when we're going to be joined by Emer Finnegan, Director General of the Council Legal Service and the Legal Council of the European Council. So there's an S in one of those words and a C in the other. <laughs> and uh, we're really uh, delighted to have you with us um, this afternoon, Emer. Emer will speak to us for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll have a QA. and a um, Sometimes when <clears throat> people are asked to try to describe the European Union, you know, describe the Union, and I think one answer, or not bad answer, is it is it is really a compendium of rules and laws that that kind of it's one way of actually defining the European Union um, might be a little bit turgid and a lot of people might think it's a bit minimalist. But in many ways, that is that is what the European Union is. Uh, and um, Emer Finnegan, our guest this afternoon, sits very much at the top or at least, shall we say, at the centre. Um, of uh, all of the complex activity that goes on around lawmaking and law enforcement in the broadest sense um, in the European Union. Emer, as I said, is um, DG of the Council Legal Service and she's also the legal counsel of the European Council. She's the first Irish national and the second woman to hold those posts. Um, Emer has worked in the Council Legal Service since 1999, was made a director um, in 2015. As such, um, or in that role, she was responsible for legal issues in the competitiveness environment uh, and transport, telecom and energy councils, um, of which I was um, privileged to be a member myself at one point, uh, and for legal issues concerning employment, social affairs, education, agriculture and fisheries, really the whole kind of gamut of um, the competencies of the European Union, as we're familiar with it. And Ms. Finnegan was closely involved with the negotiations on the withdrawal agreement and the trade and cooperation agreement with the United Kingdom. She's extensive experience representing the Council before the Court of Justice uh, of the European Union. So we're really delighted to have you. It's a webinar this afternoon. So um, uh, you can, if you have, you're watching us, and delighted that so many of you are, you will have an opportunity to put in a question using the Q&A um, function there uh, that everybody is so familiar with now. Um, there's some other housekeeping um, um, points that I tend to forget at this point, but one most important one is that if you're asking a question, try and keep it pithy and clear so that we can read it before we actually mouth it and uh, say who you are. Give us your designation if you have one, um, please, if you're going to ask a question. But without any further delay, um, Emer Finnegan, you're really welcome to the IIA this afternoon and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Alex, and uh, and thank you for inviting me to to speak uh, with you today. Um, I regularly attend IEA meetings in Brussels, uh, so it's nice to attend a Dublin event for a change. Although it would have been even nicer to attend in person, so I'll I, I will, I'll try and see if I can do that the next time. Um, so I was asked to speak on a on a really interesting and uh, and a complex topic uh, in my address uh, for my address to you today um, about how European law has been used to address uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and uh, how the legal service assists uh, the two institutions that it serves uh, the Council and the European Council in responding to other major um, political challenges for the EU. Um, so, uh, so indeed, I'll I'll make some remarks, and then obviously, as you said, uh, happy to take some some questions from the listeners. Um, so, as you know, of course, uh, tragically, it's been more than a year and a half now since Russia since Russia began its uh, full scale invasion of Ukraine in the morning of the twenty fourth of February, twenty twenty two. I think we all remember that moment. We know where we were when that happened, and the news hit the the screens. Um, on the very same day, the European Council met and it condemned in the strongest possible terms the Russian Federation's unprovoked and unjustified military aggression against Ukraine. And it has remained seized of the matter ever since, uh, most re recently in the statement that was issued um, at the informal meeting of the members of the European Council, which was in uh, Granada last week, which I attended. And there the leaders reaffirmed that the Union will continue to support Ukraine and its people for as long as it takes. And throughout the conflict, the European Council has sent clear, consistent and, and coordinated messages in support of Ukraine. 
uh, the members of the European Council. As you know, of course, that's the, the heads of state or government, plus the president of the commission and uh, the president of the European Council. Um, they have defined the general um, political directions of union policy on this terrible conflict uh, in accordance with, with the role of the European Council. And it's going to provide some, some further guidance in its next formal meeting in Brussels, which is due a little bit later this month. Um, in the, my remarks today, I thought I would, uh, however, concentrate a little bit more on the, the legal developments uh, that have occurred in the in the other institution which we assist, uh, the Council of the EU, which um, I, I see is is often still informally ca called the Council of Ministers. It's not its official name anymore, but it's still quite descriptive. And I think this the uh, the union has has shown and the council has shown that it can face this enormous political challenge uh, with with creativity and with determination. And this has been demonstrated by the many legal acts which the council has adopted. Uh, in many cases, the council has um, had the capacity to act alone, uh, but in certain cases, it also acts obviously as as co legislator with the European Parliament. Now, obviously, acting in the face of political challenges poses uh, legal challenges because it's often in times of crisis that the union has to take unprecedented action. And the union has to find some way of rising to these new challenges. And this, in turn, is challenging for, for we lawyers uh, because, of course, we rely on, on precedent and we rely on our established legal, legal frameworks. But it's particularly at those moments that I think that our work is very important. Um, political re priorities require us to, to innovate, um, but we always um, do that while recalling our basic values. And in particular there, I'm thinking of the rule of law, which, as you know, is one of the, the values on which the union is founded. And um, this for us means that all action taken, even in times of crisis, respects the principles of principle of legality. We must respect the treaties, the general principles of law, fundamental rights as protected under the Charter and the applicable procedural requirements so that acts are validly adopted and can withstand challenge before the Court of Justice of the European Union in Luxembourg. We are an independent service. I think it's important to stress that and we act in complete impartiality. Uh, we are aware of the political context in which we operate, but we as the as the legal service are concerned only with the legality of the acts adopted and with the um, drafting quality of those acts. Now, many of the individual measures that have been taken um, in response to the invasion have made headlines and some of them are indeed uh, very creative. Um, I'll start by just mentioning briefly the, the vast scope of union law that has been affected in our response to, um, to this uh, tragic invasion. Um, we have, of course, action directed um, uh, against Russia itself. Uh, and uh, in particular, the success, successive uh, sanctions packages, our restrictive measures regime, which has been uh, very active. Um, and I'll, I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. Um, our action also involves a range of measures to support Ukraine, um, as well as measures to protect our economy from the impact of the war. Uh, in particular through the adoption by the Council of a series of acts to respond to the energy crisis, which was caused by the EU's uh, dependence on fossil fuels. Um, and uh, the, the invasion has also, on a, a different note, changed uh, the EU's approach to uh, Ukraine's desire to accede to the European Union. Um, so um, I'll also come back to the to the energy acts in a, in a moment and to one or two other points, um, but still more generally speaking, um, we have used, um, uh, for example, our um, our traditional trade instruments in order to support Ukraine by facilitating its access to our internal market through the adoption of a range of autonomous uh, trade measures so as to eliminate tariffs on their imports into the EU. Um, and this is in addition to the market access 
which was already being granted through the EU's association agreement with Ukraine, which includes uh, already a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement. We are providing uh, macro financial assistance. Um, those are acts adopted in co-decision in order to support the economy of uh, Ukraine and other assistance to facilitate its development. Um, Ukraine had already started to participate in various union programs um, under Erasmus Plus, for example, the union was already su su providing support for the, the schooling of Ukrainian children and participation in the, the sectoral programs generally has been stepped up since the war began. And the Union is providing assistance specifically to support Ukraine's armed forces. And I'll say an, a, a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, now, obviously, as you know very well in, in Ireland, and it's the case for, for all member states, um, the member states have welcomed a very large number of uh, Ukrainians fleeing the war as well. And um, it's worth noting that there the Council put in place um, uh, and in fact activated for the very first time the mechanism concerning temporary protection, um, which, um, which uh, stems from the basic act, the temporary protection Di directive, which was adopted way back in 2001. Um, and that drew um, on the experiences concerning persons uh, displaced by the conflict in former Yugoslavia. Um, and so in, in that, that crisis way back then um, led us to put a, a framework in place, uh, which is what we have uh, drawn on now. And, uh, and in fact, the council is just on the point of deciding that the specific measures for displaced uh, persons are going to be extended until March 2025 uh, to give some, um, uh, some predictability to the situation. And this, they set out minimum standards for harmonised rights throughout the union, including residency rights, the possibility to work, um, access to suitable accommodation, access to education for the young people and the necessary social welfare assistance and, uh, and medical assistance and so on, and guardianship for unaccompanied minors, of which there, there are some as well. And so Ireland uh, it has, has opted into this measure um, uh, in accordance with its, its own rules on uh, pursuant to the protocol on the, the area of freedom, security and justice. So the, the emergency toolbox of the union is, is very wide and large. Um, as I said, there are many financing tools available. There are specific emergency measures under primary law, like the energy measures that I will mention, and different competences of the union are involved. Um, there's extensive scope for common action so that we can address the, the crisis in a, in a united fashion. But there is also uh, flexibility in there where necessary for individual member states. Uh, so, in fact, our action really runs across the entire spectrum of what um, what used to be the three pillars. So the traditional un union activity, which used to be community activity, um, the, the old second pillar, which was CFSP, um, and uh, and the old third pillar, justice and home affairs, and in fact, all of these areas are are engaged by the um, uh, by the union in its response to the invasion. So to say a, a few words about um, military assistance now. Um, uh, the, the Council has put in place some concrete support to the Ukrainian war effort uh, by the provision of assistance to the Ukrainian armed forces. Um, and uh, as, as you know, I've seen the, the debates at home. Um, there has been a lot of activity by the Union uh, in matters linked to defence, and there are some interesting discussions underway in, in Ireland in relation to that. Um, under the European Peace Facility, which is a Council Act, it has shown its determination to play a part in providing military equipment to Ukraine. Now, under the treaties, military and defence expenditure cannot be financed under the Union budget. So this is a fund which relies on contributions by member states. Um, it's a defence policy measure, of course, adopted by the Council. And under the Treaty on European Union, the specific character of the security and defence policy of certain member states is respected. In particular, we have a possibility under the treaty for member states to um, constructively abstain, as it's, as it's known, when CFSP measures are adopted. 
This means that they are not obliged to um, apply the measure, uh, but they accept that the decision commits the union and they must refrain from action which would conflict with the measure. And uh, the three member states, including Ireland, avail of this possibility when uh, financing for military equipment um, for lethal purposes is um, is agreed. And instead, those member states voluntarily make a contribution in respect of non-lethal assistance. So in this way, the union has been able to move forward uh, in full respect of the national position of member states, national defence policies, in some cases constitutional requirements, uh, so that the sovereign choices of member states are, are fully respected in this uh, very sensitive area. Um, I thought I'd say a few words as well about uh, restrictive measures, as I mentioned already, um, are otherwise known as our, our sanctions regime. Um, and uh, this has been um, uh, an area in which we have adopted a very large number of, of measures um, in the past uh, year and a half since the Russian invasion. The Council had already imposed certain restrictive measures on Russia after the occupation of the Crimean Peninsula, um, but the scope and importance of the measures has been greatly extended since 2022. Um, there are sectoral measures, and these are a, a wide range of measures. I'll come back to a few of them in a moment, but essentially many of them are designed to weaken Russia's economic base, deprive it of critical technologies and markets, and hopefully uh, significantly curtail its ability to wage war. Uh, we've also adopted sanctions against Belarus because of its involvement and, and support um, uh, to the Russians. And we've adopted measures against Iran because of its um, manufacture and supply of drones um, to the Russians in the conflict. So sectoral measures involve, uh, for example, financial measures, um, restrictions on Russia's access to capital and financial markets, and a ban on using SWIFT for, for 10 Russian banks. Uh, we have transport measures. Um, the airspace uh, to to the of, of the EU is is closed to to Russia. Um, there are road restrictions as well, maritime transport restrictions. Um, we have export bans of certain goods, and we have import bans of certain goods. And it's quite an eclectic mix. We have a lot of products there. It's everything from steel and wood. Uh, gold and jewelry seafood uh, basically it's um it's it's a collection of um of import bans which are designed to cause economic uh, harm um and we even have a ban on the provision of certain services and there are measures directed against individuals and that involves uh, typically an asset freeze um for assets which are within uh, eu jurisdiction and a denial of entry into the eu uh, so these involve members of the government, uh, others engaged in the war, and um, oligarchs who, who support the Russian regime financially. Now, of course, ensuring the legality of all of these measures, um, and in particular for the individual listings, the respect for the, the fundamental rights of the persons listed is a, a big challenge for the legal service, and we're very engaged in, in litigation in Luxembourg on this. We have nearly 100 cases uh, concerning, concerning these, these regimes. Um, we provide, the council provides reasons for the listings, and it ensures that the rights of defense of these persons are respected by giving them an opportunity to comment once they have been listed. Before that, of course, you need the surprise effect and, um, and taking those comments into account. Um, so even when we act under extreme time pressure, some of these measures were taken within a couple of days of the invasion and we've continued ever since with additional packages. Um, we, still, um, we still take a lot of care to, uh, uh, to ensure that um, the measures um, are liable to, to pass muster before the, the impartial judges in Luxembourg. And so we're always vigilant in advising the council in the decisions that it takes in, in this respect. One um, interesting creative measure, which we, we had not uh, taken before, uh, concerned a ban on uh, broadcasting activities of certain, certain uh, Russian media outlets, including Russia Today. And um, 
that w that was motivated by the propaganda campaign uh, carried out by by Russia justifying its 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 military aggression and targeting civil society in the EU um and we've already had a, a judgment uh, in the first of those cases um uh, because several media outlets have have challenged that listing um and uh, so far the general court has has upheld the legality of the council's action um, it has referred to the fact that in the field of common foreign and security policy, the Council has a great deal of latitude in defining the objective of its uh, restrictive measures. And it considered that the Council could legitimately consider that these measures were necessary. Um, at the same time, it examined very carefully the evidence provided in support of the listing um, because it wanted to ensure uh, that um, the fundamental right to the freedom of expression had been um, respected insofar as necessary and proportionate. And um, the court concluded that we had done so. Though that is on appeal, so we, we, we will wait to see what the um, Court of Justice says on the appeal. Then perhaps a few words on um, energy dependency. Um, there, again, it's an example of um, uh, a certain amount of creativity on the part of the Council uh, because we have made quite extensive use of emergency powers which exist in the treaty under Article 122 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Um, and this gives the power to adopt alone measures appropriate to the economic situation, which is quite broad, um, in a spirit of solidarity. And uh, these measures must be economic in nature. Um, and uh, there we have also been careful that the Council uses this wide power responsibly because um, the use of that particular um, mechanism, which allows us to act very quickly, shouldn't um, undermine or circumvent uh, the use of the other legal basis which exist for action in, in normal times. So um, the situation has to be urgent, it has to be exceptional, and the measure should be temporary, essentially. And so we adopted several measures concerning demand reduction for gas, um, solidarity, better coordination of gas purchases. We addressed high energy prices. We laid down a framework to accelerate the deployment of renewable energy. And we established a mechanism to protect uh, union citizens and the economy against the extremely high prices which we saw uh, for energy last year. Um, so those measures have proved relatively effective. Um, and now we are in the process of considering whether it is uh, necessary and justified to prolong some or all of them, um, taking into the account the, the constraints that I have just mentioned. So just to, to sum up uh, these, these introductory remarks, um, as I say, the crisis doesn't uh, turn the union into a, a purely political organisation. Um, we always uh, try to ensure the... Um, the full respect of the the rule of law um, when faced with uh, with such an emergency situation, and that's why our work is uh, very important um, and uh, creative to certain respects, while uh, staying always within the boundaries set by the treaties and our other rules and uh, procedures. And that's what makes it uh, challenging, but also absolutely fascinating, and um, that's uh, that's our life on a on a daily basis. Um, in respect to this area of our activity. Uh, thank you very much.